Good afternoon, dear colleagues. We are about to begin the work of our session with a little bit delay. Uh, so the pure and anti-monopoly uh, counterparts of ours uh, are to blame because they had such an exciting uh, discussion that we uh, overused our time. So now we're going to proceed to uh, discuss our topic about cartel deterrence, and I would like to uh, give the first floor over to Alexander Kinyov, Deputy Head of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of the Russian Federation. I'm going to speak about the wonderful topic about increasing the effectiveness of the cartel deterrence. So I once was in the bookstore browsing there and uh, looking up uh, marketing and business uh, books and manuals and the most uh, uh, the, the one I liked best was how to uh, just enhance your reinforce your force or enhance your force your strength. I would like to give a couple of uh, background uh, comments to begin. Uh, we think that cartel deterrence as a topic uh, emerged on the agenda of the anti-monopoly service not long time ago. Some uh, real steps were made beginning from 2000. And in 2012, uh, we stated that uh, in the framework of the uh, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, we did create the system of uh, 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 cultural deterrence system. So in 2008, uh, there was a specialized uh, uh, service to, to combat cartels. So the legal foundations uh, were part of the second anti-monopoly law pack package of uh, legislation. And just also uh, during the unexpected inspections, and uh, in the third package of laws, uh, there was uh, uh, the definition of a cartel made, uh, both in the uh, administrative and civil code, and just the after the uh, amendment of the relevant legislation, we uh, got the special. Uh, instrument kit to establish and identify trace up cartels, uh, the, the possibility to use e-evidence to prove uh, anti-competition collusions. Uh, so this is uh, our statistic uh, about the uh, anti-competition uh, collusions. So the number of violations of Articles 1, 11, uh, which deals uh, specifically with cartels, 11.1. Uh, uh, so, uh, so it is a law which uh, was introduced in 2012. So, uh, relating to the anti-competition concerted action over the last two years, the number of violations and the uh, decisions made by the courts, courts has been about two. Hundred, so including the whole uh, of the uh, both the central authority and the territorial authority statistic combined, about seventy percent. The overwhelming majority are the uh, decisions that were made about the uh, collisions uh, during the auction sales and tenders. Uh, so uh, fines levied in accordance with Article fourteen. Uh, point three two uh, in billion rubles by, for violations of anti-competition law, and just about uh, a thousand of them. So the overall sum of uh, fines has been growing increasingly over the last four years. It grew fourfold. Uh, so the uh, aggregated sum uh, was about one billion rubles in 2010. In 2013, it is uh, already amounted to one. 4 billion rubles, so hence the, the number of cases goes down, whether is, whereas their weight and the um, importance uh, uh, goes up together with the uh, number of the big companies that are held liable for anti-competition violations. So our American colleagues uh, usually demonstrate this kind of slide, so we decided to borrow this practice from them. This is top 10 cases uh, uh, dealing with uh, anti-competition collusions. 
this is uh, uh, these are the cases uh, related to the major fines that were uh, just awarded, but uh, also the ones that dealt with the longest existing counter cartels or the most numerous members of the counters. The number one here is about uh, coal uh, delivery from Kuzbas. So, so the uh, largest sum of the fine, which is over 2 billion rubles, because it was a collision with the state agencies. Uh, the lowest one on the table says so deliveries, uh, material deliveries for Interior Ministry. Uh, it is the largest in terms of the number of the entities and that this cartel included. 37 uh, companies were held liable. Uh, the sodium cartel is in this list, not because of the size of the cartel, but it was the longest existing one. So the anti-monopoly bodies established uh, that it existed uh, for seven years. Uh, from an, another statistic slide that we wanted to show uh, to illustrate how the uh, cartel deterrence system works. Uh, so it has to do with the uh, applications for liability exemption uh, or called the leniency program. Uh, about two uh, dozens of uh, such applications have been received over the last uh, couple of years to the uh, anti-monopoly service. So just uh, the Russian Fast Service uh, has registered 29 such applications in 2013. So major information about this uh, area is uh, was included into uh, this publication that is uh, called from Matt is to salt, uh, which uh, is just uh, including the uh, cases uh, ranging from uh, speech, uh, some from matches, which is the first one mentioned in this publication to salt, the last one. So uh, today we would like to focus uh, about the, on the major um, uh, ways to increase the cartel deterrence effectiveness. Uh, as of today, Speaking about the major areas of our activity, we have three major of them. It's enhancing interaction with law enforcement agencies, of, uh, creating an equivocal uh, judicial or court practice, and enhancing international cooperation in the field. So I would like to tap on each of these uh, three major elements individually in terms of increasing interaction and exchange between anti-monopoly and uh, law enforcement uh, bodies. Our major partner here is the Interior Ministry. You know that uh, cartel uh, participants can be held criminally liable, which is Article 188 of the Criminal Code. So the uh, legal framework was created for this interaction was created back in 2014 on the basis of the order um, uh, on the procedure of the interaction between the Interior Ministry and the FAS. And just we are basing on a number of uh, g uh, legal documents. Uh, we also have instituted the interdepartmental uh, working groups or teams between uh, Russian FAS and Interior Ministry and between the Investigative Committee and uh, Pass. So would they discuss specific criminal cases and uh, other instances uh, so that such interaction uh, to provide for the practical implementation of this cooperation principle um, uh, between the years 1996-2013, uh, when uh, the, the new criminal code was adopted and the well, an Article 178 uh, was instituted, uh, 380 criminal cases have been brought to the courts and just 60 people were held criminally liable. Uh, so uh, law enforcement practice statistics, so the major uh, number of cases uh, uh, was uh, brought to court between 2001-2014. Uh, then, when the uh, 
Article 178 specifies the uh, uh, just crime composition. So the number of cases went down dramatically, despite the fact that in 2009 we started initiating an amendment to the criminal code uh, that would stimulate uh, the activity of the, our uh, law enforcement agencies. However, the situation didn't change for the better much. So today, criminal cases are brought um, to the court, uh, the number between 10 to 20, uh, and uh, almost zero statistic for the investigated cases. Uh, so in 2011, uh, there were four criminal cases that were channeled to the courts, 2012-1 and 2013-0. So if we see, uh, compare the effectiveness of FASA Russia and uh, Interior Ministry, so in 2000 it was 187 uh, decisions about the violations of Article 1 uh, of the Com Competition Protection Law in 2012-75 and 2000. 2013, 148. And you can see a number of the cases in the, the uh, counterpart. So if the Federal and Anti-Monopoly Commission service uh, determines that there were some uh, signs of a crime, so we uh, channel the case to the law enforcement agencies, not in the form of a letter as previously, but an official um, uh, just uh, in a report based on the Article 145 to the Criminal Procedure Code. So 56 of them uh, uh, were channeled in 2014. Nine cases were uh, instigated, but zero was channeled to the court finally. Uh, so uh, we uh, have been in the ongoing process of reorganization uh, about six months. Uh, so the staff members so of the uh, general directorate of uh, combating economic crimes and uh, anti-corruption were under reorganization. And uh, there are further uh, reform uh, processes underway, and of course it uh, complicates the work of law enforcement and police agencies. And uh, the Interior Ministry uh, almost uh, does almost nothing in order to uh, hold just to hold uh, cultural participants uh, criminally liable, according to Article 178. So the principle of the unavoidability of punishment doesn't work. And last year, week we had a meeting with the uh, President of Russia, and just uh, a possible solution could be to provide uh, the anti-monopoly um, uh, institutions with the inquiry functions. Uh, there is a list on the slide of uh, the entities that uh, can uh, do inquiry. Uh, and if uh, Russian FAS uh, could have uh, done, could have been awarded these functions and competences, we could have done pre um, uh, procedural check and uh, investigation and do other things. Uh, however, now this issue is being discussed with the president and worked on. So we hope that we'll be moving in this direction in the future. Uh, the way uh, we did uh, uh, seeking enhancing of interaction, enhancing our interaction and co coordination with the police and law enforcement uh, authorities. A couple of words about the uh, positive uh, court practice. So reorganization is underway as well. So the uh, the Supreme Court has been uh, reformed. The Supreme Arbitration Court will soon cease functioning. So we should wait till all these reforms and initiatives are finalized so that we could begin the new wording coining a new wording of the uh, resolution of the plenum of the uh, high arbitration uh, uh, court uh, that will deal with the cartel activity and their deterrent. Now it is uh, suspended. Uh, 
As to the statistic, uh, we try to uh, generalize uh, our interaction and with the courts in terms of the cartel deterrence. Uh, the uh, upper line is uh, how much uh, decisions uh, FAS of Russia issues and um, into and lower is the number of decisions uh, that they uh, that uh, uh, that were recognized as invalid by the courts. Uh, so courts uh, uh, just uh, uh, recognize them void uh, many times. So up to 25 percent uh, uh, grew the number of the uh, void decisions, and now 15 percent on cartel uh, collusion. Uh, statistic uh, of rejected cases for 2010. Uh, so, mm, uh, so the position of the High Arbitration Court for the last case was not very clear for us, and as they did not want to review a quite a promising case uh, relating to one of our chemical cartels. Uh, what else uh, we would like to discuss uh, here? Uh, we would like to remind the audience that the cartels are banned and prohibited uh, in the Russian legislation per se, which was also uh, uh, a principle we borrowed from our American counterparts. And unfortunately, it's not always that this principle is worked on correctly by our courts. One more thing relating to court decisions we wanted to raise here. This is my personal opinion. However, I think that I can share it. The, the Article 52 of the Competition Protection Law um, suspends uh, the resolutions of the Anti-Monopoly uh, Authority uh, for the period of uh, court appeal. Uh, that means that the violators can uh, basically go on violating the, the law and just uh, uh, delay of, uh, paying fines and other things. We consulted with our international counterparts about this, so and just, uh, they were surprised to find this uh, legislation still active in the current Russian legislation. Uh, maybe that was the right thing to do when anti-monopoly uh, legislation was nascent and just emerging. However, today I would have... Uh, uh, amended Article 52 basing on uh, the principle that is valid in other international jurisdictions, meaning that the decision of the state body should be first implemented and then uh, can be subject to appeal only. So, uh, according to the rating of the efficiency of uh, uh, anti-monopoly authorities, according to the uh, uh, GCR, in 2013, the Russian FAS was uh, on the 17th place. So in June 2013, the Competition Committee of OECD recognized um, uh, the competition policy of Russia being in compliance with OECD standard. And also our successes were uh, acknowledged by the working group of the International uh, Competition Network. Uh, so this working group uh, uh, has two subgroups. Uh, uh, the, the first one studies the main element of effective investigation and punishment for the most the most dangerous cartels, and the second one deals in analysis and ex and um, uh, experience dissemination. In order to enhance international um, cooperation, we need to base on practical case analysis. Uh, wherever it is possible or necessary, we find a way to interact with our foreign counterparts. A couple of examples to prove that. Uh, so Vietnamese uh, fish imports to Russia, we were dealing it together with anti-monopoly counterpart from Vietnam, from Vietnamese agricultural ministry and in the framework of this uh, investigation. So. Uh, uh, so uh, the committee on Pangasius expert to Russia uh, 
was uh, eliminated by the Ministry of Agriculture as a result of this investigation. Now the Yakutia case, uh, the first time that the international legal entity was held liable, and as the decision on the case was ruled, uh, the ruling was made last year. Another uh, case, uh, which is called uh, Norwegian fish uh, import uh, to Russia, we also worked with Norwegian counterparts and uh, their regulators. We got a lot of positive experiences and information exchange uh, from the institutions that work in the field. Uh, another case is Uzbekistan that was uh, centered around pushing out MTS, one of our major mobile providers from their market. Uh, they were registered as Uzbek legal entities and we established uh, just the cartel collusion to be pleasant there, and just two legal entities were held li were charged uh, uh, with uh, being part of this uh, cartel, which negatively affected the Russian economy. And another ocean cartel case, which is now being. Uh, processed. Uh, so these are the major ocean container carriers and the Russian agents uh, of them are alle alleged uh, with uh, cartel collusion to raise prices for their services finally. What are the major challenges that we currently face in, in, uh, in uh, cooperating with international counterparts? Uh, one of the major uh, ones is uh, there is no strict requirement of the language uh, uh, of the uh, investigation documents. And uh, also just um, procedures for interaction and uh, many others. Uh, all these issues could have been resolved had there been a document that could have been uh, adopted as a major regulator. Uh, this morning we already discussed it and just uh, the, uh, this morning we received uh, uh, Another support from the uh, vice president. Uh, so we, we just wanted to um, uh, develop and sign international convention for cartel deterrence that uh, would help us do our job. So should we be successful with this international convention? Another initiative that was first voiced last year, the same forum, uh, which was uh, modeling on the international Interpol, creating a global organization to combat cartels that could have been named Glo Global Antitrust. Uh, but we still welcome other uh, ideas with the name of this uh, Organization. Another issue uh, which was uh, quite telling in Uzbekistan uh, case uh, and helped us formulate this issue, unlike the criminal code that uh, provides for criminal liability uh, allegations, uh, so entities that act against uh, the interests of the Russian Federation, like in Ukraine, where now some cases were brought uh, against some of the Ukrainian citizens, nationals, uh, according to the administrative law, and this is the law which we mostly use, to hold administratively liable and to levy a fine uh, on the uh, international uh, or foreign national is not possible, so we wanted to initiate uh, relevant amendments and changes to this legislation. So we want uh, to include uh, a provision that would help us levy fine and hold international uh, nas foreign national companies uh, liable. And finally, what I was uh, driving to uh, in the course of my presentation, we would like uh, answering uh, the, the question about what we do to uh, achieve effective cultural deterrence. Uh, 
uh, we're based on this the three major areas and all of them uh, basically are done in, in close conjunction with the top uh, leadership of the country and all the, uh, the authorities that uh, are vested in these functions and of course this uh, we need to feder to interact actively with the interior, interior ministry. We, uh, of course, need to uh, rely upon support of the Supreme Court because we need to develop the positive court practice. And, uh, of course, law enforcement agencies' interaction is not possible without the support of the interior ministry of Russia. So, finally, uh, so there is a public uh, uh, need for such monopoly uh, anti-monopoly regulation should be in place and we want to feel support from society more. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander Yurevich, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, when I was preparing this session with the colleagues, I, I wanted you to be the first speaker because you were the one who were one of the uh, kind of founding fathers of the process of cartel deterrence, the real combating process, because uh, legislative changes uh, did not occur between two, before 2008, five years down the road. We can uh, assess whether a lot has been achieved or not. So, But you said that there's, there's very low, if any, uh, criminal statistic in terms of the criminal criminal cases brought to the court about cartel uh, in cartel cases but uh, 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 so the uh, high amnesty uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the, the fact that th these cases were subject to high amnesty uh, 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 explains why we have so few, if any, cases brought to the courts for criminal liability. Uh, of course, we need a lot more to do. Uh, do we really need to um, empower uh, the uh, anti-monopoly authorities uh, to an extent of uh, avoiding them inquiry functions? It's a disputable issue. And sometimes we think you have even too many functions and competences because they still want more and more and more to include into their competence area. Uh, however, seriously speaking, we try not to overuse these uh, powers and competences. Uh, we try uh, to stick within our competence field ourselves and uh, prevent others from overusing them. Uh, there are some negative things uh, apart from a lot of achievements that we heard about. We will discuss these negative things further on. But the, the mere fact that five years ago only we were just uh, creating the cartel deterrence and combating directorate and introduce the first changes, and now we already want to initiate the international convention and Interpol-like um, institution in, in cartel deterrence field, it's really a big uh, leap to make. Uh, and uh, this uh, has been a very good overview of what has happened over the years in this field in your presentation. So maybe our colleagues will come up with the questions or comments about what has just been said. It's not a question uh, about your presentation, but it's a practically oriented one, rather, because uh, you said that uh, you have to increase and enhance interaction with other local uh, anti-competition -com authorities and international cooperation, and you are waiting for the resolution of the plenum of the High Arbitration Court. Maybe you need some support from uh, NGOs or some other expert communities that we uh, might call for because you might benefit from them. I think your major help from you could be uh, in uh, the field of ensuring the uh, comprehensiveness 
and the extent of profitability uh, of the Russian fuss, because these are the major uh, um, uh, challenges. Uh, uh, because uh, these are the things that uh, are appealed for in court, also by members of the not-for-profit uh, partnership lawyers. Uh, but uh, uh, some people want us to get to the Proskrastian bed of uh, the standards of proof uh, for cartel existence. I don't think there are any standards. However, we need to base upon the uh, um, uniform approaches so that the court system uh, understands more uh, of what we do. Uh, we need to do that using the examples of some specific cases, some administrative uh, code amendments and other things. May I, may I ask a question? Thank you very much for your presentation and for your conclusions. One brief comment and a question. A brief comment is as follows. Of course, the idea of uh, make first implementing the decision and then uh, probably uh, appealing it is a good one. But violations can go on and on. But there is the reverse side. If we do, as you say, then we should uh, have this full, the institute for full compensation of uh, losses if your decision is later cancelled. Uh, thinking about those 15 percent uh, of the uh, decision cancelled, then the, uh, there must be some institute to be responsible for covering uh, the damage. So uh, this week we had the decision of the Supreme uh, Arbitrary Court on the inspections. If I understand and interpret the uh, verdict correctly, the court bans those non-planned inspections, surprise inspections, if it is not by the decision of the court. So I don't know how you are planning to uh, work within this context. So first, tackling the third part of your comments. At uh, our today's morning session, our colleague from South Africa mentioned uh, the public interests. And when we are discussing about the interests of a specific company that can really suffer from the antitrust uh, agency or others to uh, pass uh, some uh, ha ha uh, bad, bad decision for them. So, but if this uh, violation continues for several years, it is highly detrimental. And you know that sometimes such processes can last for several years. So we should always think about the balance and striving to find one. And always think about what serves public interests, uh, consumers' interests best. As for the specific uh, court case that you've mentioned, probably uh, talking about the cancellation of the methodological recommendations for such inspections. Yes, indeed, we're having a court dispute uh, with uh, one of the organizations located in St. Petersburg. Mm, this procedure has been going on for several years, so uh, the case uh, is now being investigated, and the administration is trying to uh, 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 just uh, appeal to various courts. Unfortunately, they lost several cases. And uh, uh, then, uh, as you say, some of the methodological recommendations have been cancelled. Um, there is a, a certain administrative uh, set of regulations for inspections of this kind. Then there is a letter uh, directed by the antitrust agency to its territorial divisions calling those methodological recommendations. And then this organization for some reason decided to start from the end and uh, to appeal to the other court. Uh, but still no consequences so far. Uh, so the law is still active. 
uh, methodology too. So we will continue our inspections as we used to conduct them. So uh, some organizations, they try to uh, initiate cases, as many cases as possible for some reason. So uh, this uh, decision has not yet been enacted. It's, uh, it was only um, kind of made last Wednesday, but it was only about methodological recommendations, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, nothing else. Uh, so um, there can be no cancellation as such, because it builds on administrative regulations, because it is the administrative regulations that really stipulate what to do. And then methodology uh, describes only the subtleties of the process. So probably they will uh, mandate that we wear not black suit, but just gray suit when conducting such inspections. But it's nothing more than that. As for the uh, this uh, um, comment that you had, we uh, uh, know that in the U.S., so when they learn about, uh, when one of the cartel participants uh, just rats on others, then we can uh, start the case against the cartel. And according to the Russian legislation, should some company realize that um, the case is open, and then they tr just uh, uh, provide information, and then they s kind of elucidate it. So, but now, what are the regulations? So, if a cartel has been revealed uh, as a result of investigation, and then uh, there there must be some cases that are initiated because some of the cartel participants come to inform you about the contra cartel. Is there any proportion that you can share or anything at all? Yes, indeed, you are right. In February, uh, with the uh, we were in Brussels and colleagues shared it with us that about 90 to 95 percent cases against cartels were started uh, when uh, some cartel participants uh, tried to find shelter and started cooperating with the agencies. It's not like that in Russia, maybe because of the shorter history of such cases and all that, and uh, we'll, let's wait and see what happens. As of today, I do not have any such statistics. But according to my estimation, uh, 10 to 20 percent of cases are initiated when the company uh, brings information, and then we start collecting additional information. Other uh, kind of uh, bits of information just come uh, only when some company should realize that uh, enough evidence has been collected against it, and in order to minimize their liability, they come and inform the antitrust agencies of uh, their role, because that kind of uh, mm, uh, makes them non-liable. So, but we haven't had any case when somebody would, driven by his uh, own initiative, would come to disclose a cartel. I would like to add one thing more here. Uh, it's uh, just that it was the high arbitrary court that interpret provided the interpretation of that norm, that you can really uh, just appeal to be liberated from responsibility, from liability, and um, uh, I think that and it contradicts the law a little bit. And so after this transition period, and when companies start. Uh, realizing uh, what benefit it uh, gives, and then they will stum come and report about um, this thing. Then we will have to change the, uh, the, the resolution of the court um, and be stricter. Yes, we did have some cases when antitrust agency is ready to pass uh, its verdict and the lawyer stands up to and asks for a break. Then on his knee during the break in the corridor, he writes an application to uh, just uh, liberate uh, his client from liability because he is ready to cooperate, and we have to do that. But this is a temporary phenomenon. It will change, I'm sure.
Are there any more questions, colleagues? Then uh, the question was asked, uh, how can the legal community help you? Yesterday we had an interesting event. We had business lunch where we discussed a lot of antitrust issues and when we had a very lively discussion. And very often the answer of our representatives uh, reminded me, immortal uh, quotation, on other uh, boards our chess grossmeister did not really make us happy with the variety. Uh, so, because what we say, so this uh, and this norm allows for ambiguous interpretation. This uh, rule uh, doesn't let us work, and so on and so forth. What can we do? Then the colleagues say, a reply, yes, indeed, we uh, agree that this definition is ambiguous. We agree that this rule is uh, not functional. And in my view, Mm, the best thing would be to sit down together to kind of finalize this uh, definition of this rule in a functionable way. And so we have this uh, NGO, the, the, uh, and uh, legal agency, and I will be very happy to give the floor over to uh, Vasily Rodamina, senior partner, law firm Alrod. So, ladies and gentlemen, I did not expect to be the second speaker during this session. It's I'm highly pleased, thank you. So, taking into consideration the fact that we have been assembling here for a separate uh, session on cartels for the second year, it is obvious that uh, just uh, anti-cartel activities is one of the top priorities of the antitrust agency. It has been mentioned not once by the head of the said agency. And as you can see, we, uh, as it often happens in Russia, we immediately started uh, talking about something that is non-existent in the rest of the world even, about creating a new international convention, about creating a global anti-cartel organization and so on. So what does it show? It shows that uh, the struggle against cartels, including the international ones, um, is uh, a high priority for the antitrust uh, department in the Russian Federation. So, in our view, uh, just the struggle with international cartels ought to be one of the top priorities in the uh, operations of the Russian antitrust uh, service. This is one of the most uh, dangerous types of collusions and they and cartels and they really uh, serve to the detriment of not only the national economy but also of the global economy as such. Looking at the statistics of EU for example, between 2010 and 14 European Commission considered more than 25 international cases between 2005 and 2009, 33 cases. And uh, this is a large number. These are large cases about large fines that sum up to billions of euros. We are not included into this process, and my personal conviction is that those enormous losses uh, carried by the cartel participants because they are persecuted in the countries with developed economies, these losses are then compensated by the development of the market including uh, those cartel members compensate for this uh, damage uh, operating on the Russian market. That uh, serves to the benefit of the developed countries, but it serves to the detriment of the developing countries. And that means that we should do much more than we are currently doing. Uh, in order to struggle with those cartels. We all uh, remember the latest investigations conducted in EU. That is uh, the investigation that is still going on on LIBOR. This is the case of monitors, on oh no, displays, uh, then uh, the market of spare parts and so on. I don't know for sure, but my uh, feeling is that those cartels not only cover not only the uh, EU, uh, US, Korea, South Korea, we feel that they can really spread much further. 
but I'm not sure. I don't know about that. So last year, uh, I was a speaker at a similar session, and we discussed the issues uh, related with international cartels. And it was, and then what was said was, well, well, we discussed what should be done to have Russia included into this. Uh, process of anti-cartel movement, not to lag behind this international trend within the framework of which antitrust operations develop. So what are the achievements as of late? Uh, we have just heard it now in the uh, core speaker's presentation that uh, it was about this law enforcement practice. National cartels are being investigated into, the number of cases keeps growing, the number of closed cases still grows. This is very important, there is no deny. But we should remember that the Russian FAS has the power of investigating into any cartel cases, including those cartels that uh, uh, formed beyond the boundaries of the Russian Federation. Previously, it had not been possible. Last year, in May 2013, I mentioned already that this right is not used or is largely underused. Within the past year, we have witnessed a big shift. First, investigations against international cartels started in Russia, meaning that the first step has been made on this uh, necessary route. We uh, signaled, gave us an important signal to the global market. Uh, the market, uh, the, uh, the global market has heard, noticed this signal. My uh, uh, colleagues abroad, they all discuss this investigation by Russian FAS. They uh, have a vivid interest towards uh, what is going on in this regard. Then uh, we heard that the interaction keeps uh, that uh, we have stronger and stronger interaction with law enforcement uh, agencies. Of course, the statistics of the uh, last several years is negative, but uh, besides that, there is no informational support for this kind of activity. We know nothing about uh, those investigations and how they are evolving and what challenges law enforcement agencies face. For us, it's an absolutely closed zone. We know a lot about fast activities and we know little of anything about the activities of the law enforcement uh, departments. And this is wrong because cartel participants, they uh, must uh, realize that uh, the, kind of the government is just uh, conducting very active steps um, against them. Another positive uh, phenomenon is uh, that, uh, uh, well, this uh, cooperation with antitrust agencies of other countries uh, coming up onto new levels. And force of a variety of uh, circumstances, I can't disclose the details, but we do know that in quite a number of cases, this cooperation uh, Mm, between antitrust uh, agencies of the Russian Federation and similar agencies aboard, uh, they have uh, come on to a totally qualitatively different uh, level. It's no longer just friendly working meetings, but they are more, much more constructive. I must uh, assure you that we haven't stopped being friends at the same time. Yes, of course. And at the same time, quite a number of problems have been revealed. Uh, the problems and challenges that uh, uh, anti-cartel agency uh, faces in its activities. Uh, mm, I can uh, speak of it as a practicing lawyer. There is no stipulated order about the exchange of information between countries, uh, information concerning anti-cartel activity. Then there are no joint uh, checkups on the territories of foreign countries. Uh, no routines for uh, just handing in re procedural documents in foreign countries. Also, just uh, the procedures of uh, collecting fines uh, from foreign companies found guilty in Russia. 
uh, are not clear. And uh, for example, this Uzbeki cartel. Some of those uh, problems can be tackled only within the framework of uh, European Convention only, but some of them are, uh, can be tackled within uh, the framework that we are having now. And our international uh, community can really assist us uh, within the frameworks of the existing conventions and uh, Mm, joint, uh, help us in conducting a joint analysis with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about what tools can be used. Perhaps this is all that we have managed to do within the past year. Now, speaking about uh, what is the priority uh, in the nearest future, at least uh, in the period uh, between the two fora, I believe uh, signing an international convention is a long-term objective requiring several years. What we need is something very quick. We have to start finding solutions to our problems. Now, in this respect, we uh, uh, we we have a a concern about uh, the lack of proper reflection of uh, our issues, uh, our problems uh, in the material of, of the uh, forum. On the one hand, uh, a uh, AMAC action is very important. On the other hand, there's uh, virtually nothing being done in terms of drafting uh, real legislation. So what is our proposal? We suggest attacking the issue of um, um, уже нельзя возбудить административное дело, как вы знаете. На наш взгляд, это очень короткий срок для для картелей. Расследование дел о международных картелях это процесс долгий кропотливый требующий грандиозных усилий по анализу документации по сбору документации и три, три года однозначно вступает в, в, в противоречие здесь с реальной ситуацией как мы видим по статистике западной я об этом говорил в на расследование картели уходит 7-8 лет. Uh, typical time frame for an anti-cartel investigation is seven years. If we fail uh, to follow, to go along this avenue, what the only recourse uh, that will be left for us is uh, court action, litigation. Second priority, second uh, item uh, to be dealt with is uh, the time frame of investigation. Our laws do not provide for an adequate time frame for a proper investigation. The non-professional part of our uh, community uh, may um, treat our proposal uh, with uh, skepticism. However, we do insist on the prolongation of the extension of time frames of investigation. In Western countries, such investigations take years. Years will pass until the uh, AT authority uh, uh, comes to the root of the matter, collects the evidentiary base and uh, so many other things. Russian FAS has to find ad hoc solutions uh, to extend the time frame uh, through uh, initiating expertise analysis, uh, which uh, gives a, a sort of breathing uh, period uh, to handle and process um, uh, the collected documentation. What do we suggest immediately? We suggest an immediate extension of time frame for anti-cartel investigations. Second, 
we believe uh, that uh, time frame should be extended until we get uh, the required documentation from the company the so-called stop clock principle next program of uh, release from uh, liability this program does not work it's not effective we could uh, could have done so much uh, should this program uh, be there in existence and uh, it, it's a it's a pure loss pure loss of opportunity in terms of uh, uh, anti-cartel action the existing program is not effective it doesn't work Applications uh, that we receive are done mostly within uh, open cases. Now, we being aware that there's release from um, criminal responsibility does not exist, we cannot expect any serious breakthrough in anti-cartel um, investigation, anti-cartel action, especially uh, trans uh, uh, transboundary. In terms of leniency, we have to solve the following issues. First, uh, we have to uh, uh, define what kind of information is needed to identify a cartel agreement. Next, uh, we have to address uh, the lacunes and lacks in, uh, of uh, legal frameworks. We need to address issues uh, of um, uh, denying or deterring participation in the cartel, absence of such a recourse uh, severely uh, hinders uh, the activities of SAS. Next, the release from, uh, from uh, re responsibility both for individuals and uh, co corporations. Part of the problems can be solved through new legislation. Part of the problems can be uh, solved uh, through ad hoc regulation. Within the government, we have established a special working group uh, to brainstorm uh, uh, the challenge. Uh, hopefully, that um, with the help of uh, our friends, um, we will be able to offer a solution. A solution. Uh, leading to the emergence of a proper legal framework uh, uh, to tackle uh, the, these issues, to kickstart uh, the anti-cartel action in Russia. I'm very happy that, uh, as of this year, FAS is a co-chairman of the International Task Force for anti-cartel deterrence. This is a good uh, occasion uh, to uh, lead the effort, international effort, not only national, uh, but to do that we must adjust uh, our national law uh, to international standards and best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Vasily. Well, I would like to th Thank you for having taken, assumed the um, role of uh, the custodian of uh, expert knowledge. You have reminded us of uh, good practices and uh, n negative practices, uh, therefore the presentation was pretty balanced. Now looking askew to the uh, right uh, flank meaning our dep our um, MPs. I would like to say that our ideas are full of good ideas. We could offer you definitions, we could offer you proposals and recommendations, but it is up to you to make laws. One of the most effective method of um, 
fighting uh, cartels is a release from uh, liability or responsibility. Admin administrative, uh, uh, criminal or otherwise. We do practice uh, the release from uh, administrative liability, but uh, there's no practice of uh, release from criminal liability. You cannot expect anyone to cooperate with you in a true sense of the word if you do not uh, uh, promise them uh, something of the sort. Another interesting issue to increase the speed of bureaucratic machinery in uh, on the track of AC action. AC action must uh, be sped up in the accountability of the government and ministries. The formula of 6 plus 3 is uh, simply uh, too short a uh, time uh, to formulate uh, the um, evidence base uh, to prepare defenses and to uh, apply claims. Do you have anything to end or comment on what was said? Uh, a couple of words, if I may, about time frames. I do agree with that. It is a real problem, especially in terms of uh, participation in the uh, legal framework, uh, um, requesting information, receiving information. This is the, uh, this is a huge loss of time. In order to hand over an official letter to. Uh, an international uh, company. There's a whole procedure to be followed. One embassy, another embassy, uh, protocols, uh, confirmations, notifications. This is an extremely long process uh, which uh, completely despoils our time frames. Next is the uh, architecture of uh, litigation. Usually cartel investigations involve uh, tens um, or maybe even hundreds of uh, participants. There's a need uh, to uh, investigate every one of them, not in parallel, but the one after another. This is extremely time-consuming. Time Provided you would uh, initiate uh, such uh, legislation, we will promise that we will support it. Another issue which is very visible at uh, International Fora is the release from uh, uh, responsibility, except respons uh, criminal responsibility. There's no automaticity in uh, the release from criminal responsibility. It would be very great if uh, on just uh, one application, an applicant would be released from all types of responsibility. The, the reality is uh, in the field in in Russia are such that uh, every uh, type of responsibility is being administered by a different uh, bureaucratic authority. Initiation of criminal proceedings is the responsibility or jurisdiction of, uh, of the police. We need a uh, one slot uh, principle here. I am sure that uh, this idea would find support virtually uh, from everybody here present.
life would be so much more simple should we have a one slot principle one paper to release uh, from all types of responsibility the solution is there there's a lack of uh, goodwill or political uh, a political engagement We have had only 29 applications last year to relieve uh, of uh, criminal responsibility. One small comment, if I may. I would also like to support the idea about a prescription for liability. Our prescription provides for 10 years. In other countries, the prescription is 33 years. It is only too often the case that we have to terminate cases, investigations, simply because the prescription they were expired. Any more questions? Let's put them off to the end of the discussion. One of the aspects that we have touched upon in our key keynote speech is the action against the international cartels. I would uh, very much like to uh, hear uh, Mr. José Olivier, Commissioner for uh, co uh, of the uh, South African Republic. Uh, let me express my gratitude to the organizers and FESA Russia for, for this invitation. It is indeed an honor to, to be here and to share the South African experience around cartel uh, detection and uh, deterrence. Um, I thought uh, what I would do very, very quickly is before I, what I wanted to sh actually share uh, with this audience is a spe specific example of a enforcement case that we have done uh, recently. It has been uh, described as one of the largest cartel investigations in, in South Africa. I think there's lots of uh, lessons to be learned from that case, and I would share some of those uh, lessons uh, with the audience uh, here as well. Um, before I get into that specific case, uh, can I maybe take the opportunity to say a little bit about uh, the different mechanisms that South Africa have in place to, to detect uh, cartels? Firstly, is um, our legislation is about uh, 16 years old. And we've been uh, detecting cartels for the last uh, 15 years. And we have gained some useful experience, uh, not just uh, with our uh, own uh, investigation, but also learning from the experiences of uh, other countries as well, having a look at what uh, programs they have in place. Uh, and we've learned a lot from, 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 uh, from other countries. One of the, one of the tenets of uh, the South African legislation is that uh, cartel conduct is per se unlawful uh, in, in South Africa. It has three elements uh, to, uh, to a cartel agreement. It also includes a concerted practice as well, uh, which also infringes uh, the act. But three elements of the act is, number one is uh, price fixing, number two is market allocation, and the third is uh, collusive uh, tendering. So the act specifically uh, you know, talks about those three forms of uh, uh, conduct. Now, there's also a, another aspect to the act uh, which uh, we have not yet tested in the, in, in the courts. Um, it is uh, one of the provisions of uh, section four of our act where it talks about in particular uh, exchange of information, but uh, exchange of information in the context where it is a rule of reason uh, type of uh, investigation. So we haven't as yet tested that in a, in a, in a court of law because it uh, requires us to prove the effects it also uh, uh, gives the, the, the respondent firms an opportunity as well to prove uh, efficiency uh, defenses. So we haven't tested that. But the per se cartel conduct, we have uh, widely, widely used uh, that provision. And we have been very successful in, uh, in, in detecting 
and uh, neutralizing uh, many of the cartels in, in, South Af in South Africa. Now, the penalty for cartels in South Africa is uh, basically uh, it is uh, a fine that we can levy. Uh, it's 10% it's of annual uh, turnover, which also includes exports from the country as well. So we take that uh, you know, amount uh, in, into our account. Um, I must say that uh, thus far, uh, you know, the kind of range of fines that we have been uh, levering over the years have been increasing. Uh, we've been getting uh, very much closer to the 10%. There are some cartels where we have levered 10% of the annual turnover. And um, some of those fines have been pretty, pretty uh, high in comparison to maybe the, uh, uh, you know, the European Commission as well. Our fines have been almost as high as, as the Euro European Commission as well. Um, our law is still very much administrative in nature. We have amended our act in 2009 to include criminal liability for individual uh, directors, but we have not yet put that into effect. And for a number of reasons, uh, the government uh, has not put it into effect. I think largely because um, uh, the current programs that are in place are working quite well, and uh, we're looking to leverage much more uh, deterrence from the current program. We do not believe that the current program, the leniency program, we have exhausted uh, the leniency program. We do believe that uh, we still need to gain a much more uh, from, from the leniency program. Um, so I've already touched on the leniency program. So one of the programs we have, in 2004, we implemented the corporate leniency program. Uh, it works pretty much similar to most of the programs uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, unfortunately, ringleaders also can apply for immunity if they are first uh, through, uh, through the door. Um, we also, in our act, we also have the ability to negotiate uh, settlement agreements uh, with, with parties. So that uh, expedites uh, a lot of our cases. And our cartel cases, uh, you know, with uh, investigations, uh, because of the ability to negotiate settlements, uh, it can be quite quick. Uh, between one year to two years, we can complete quite a complex uh, cartel investigation uh, involving multiple firms and even firms across the, the border as well. We do have uh, extra uh, territorial jurisdiction as well. Any uh, effect on the economy of uh, South Africa, we do, we do have the ability to investigate. So even if a firm is located outside of the borders of uh, South Africa, but, they con uh, but if they are involved in cartel conduct, that has an effect on the economy of South Africa, then we have jurisdiction to uh, investigate those firms. Um, as you know that, uh, you know, the economy um, of the world is becoming borderless. We do find that uh, many of the international, uh, the multinationals do operate across the borders, and we do find a lot of multinationals operating in South Africa. And uh, we do find sometimes that they may not have the parent company located on the territory, but they do have subsidiaries in the, you know, on our territory. So we do go after the subsidiaries as well, and we get orders against uh, the subsidiaries, and we are able to enforce our judgments against uh, the subsidiaries. Fortunately for us, uh, many of the, the international cartels that we have investigated, many of them have chosen to uh, settle, settle with us. So we've been fortunate uh, in, 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 in that, that sense. I think it would be a good example of looking at uh, international cartels that are not willing to settle and where we have to prosecute them. I think then it might become a little bit more complicated in terms of how we uh, you know, prosecute an international cartel that's not willing to uh, settle uh, with, the, with the commission. Now, we've had many challenges as well in terms of uh, you know, prosecuting uh, cartels. I think the one challenge we had was a legal challenge. Uh, in the early years, uh, you know, when the law was still being tested in the, in the courts, jurisprudence was still very uh, much immature. Um, many of the leading uh, uh, advocates and lawyers in South Africa, uh, as you know, that uh, most of the firms would hire high-powered uh, lawyers and advocates, and they will challenge every aspect of the law. And we had many of our cases uh, going to the highest court in the land, our constitutional court, where one specific challenge was around the schema of the act. The act was very specific in terms of uh, you know, the sequence of events. Uh, we had to, uh, the commission must first initiate a case, we got to investigate the case, and then we got to refer the case. And uh, in the early years, uh, 
we ourselves didn't understand how the schema of the act worked and we would sometime initiate a case and you know because we had the evidence we would bypass the investigative stage and go uh, directly to the referral stage and um, we used to be contested uh, on, 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 on the technicalities of the act but uh, suffice to we learn from our own experiences and we managed to now uh, you know um, be able to uh, you know produce a case whilst following the tenets of, uh, of, 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 the, of the act. So I think uh, your cartel uh, detection in South Africa has been quite, uh, quite good. Um, we've had uh, challenges, but I think we've managed to overcome uh, many of those uh, challenges. I want to very quickly uh, maybe um, give an example of one of the biggest cartel investigations in South Africa that we concluded uh, last year, in around July last year. This investigation took us about um, uh, two years to, to, to complete. We had a dedicated team of uh, investigators working on this case, together with in-house uh, lawyers and in-house economists. Um, so, and um, it was a project uh, that uh, we uh, were under pressure to uh, finalize. Um, one of the reasons why we uh, decided to become a, a, a little creative in this part particular market sector because it's one of the priority market sectors in South Africa, construction and infrastructure. And um, we realized that uh, from our own investigations, from many of the scoping exercises that we've done in the various uh, markets, and from the screenings that we've done in the various markets, we realized that, uh, you know, that, that the construction environment was very, very fertile for, for cartels. Uh, in, in particular, uh, the construction market in South Africa is very concentrated, and we know that concentrated markets is a fertile ground for cartels to flourish. And uh, so we targeted uh, construction as a, as a priority sector, and um, so we started to do a lot of investigations into this sector, and we started to also get a lot of complaints uh, from clients, where clients of various uh, infrastructure projects, uh, in particular the government, uh, during the 2010 uh, uh, period and before that, the government was building a lot of World Cup stadiums for the Soccer World Cup in 2010. And they were spending a lot of money on these stadiums and they noticed that um, you know, the cost of building the stadium was escalating on a regular basis. And they became very suspicious and they reported that uh, to, to the competition authority. And in addition to that, the competition authority's uh, leniency program was also working very well at the time. And um, in about 20, 2009, one of the, uh, one of the many uh, firms in South Africa, one of the large construction firms, they came through and they applied for uh, uh, many leniencies. In fact, 165 uh, acts uh, of uh, leniency where they uh, uh, cited that they were involved in 165 different contraventions. And I think that that uh, kind of got us a bit excited and we realized that um, that uh, collusion was widespread in this sector. And there was, wasn't a possibility, and we realized that uh, one of the challenges was, will be is to investigate each case uh, individually and independently. We realized that it will take us many, many, many years to investigate it. And with the limited resources that we had, we realized that we were not capable of even finalizing all these investigations. So what we did is we, 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 we devised a program. And this program, and if there's, I'm no, I know this is a legal forum, and I'm hoping there are some economists here, so the economists uh, will understand uh, you know, the prisoner's dilemma and, and game theory much better than I do, because I'm a lawyer by trade. Uh, so what we did is we grounded this program on the principles of a prisoner's dilemma and on the principles of game theory. And we kind of said uh, that the incentive for the firms would be to come forward and to actually apply for leniency. That would be the dominant strategy of the firm, given the program that we put in place. So what we did is we, we sent an invitation out to all the firms that we believed that was involved in the construction cartel. And this was over 50 firms, including the top six firms uh, involved with uh, construction. We sent an invitation and we said, uh, if you apply for leniency, and if you make a full disclosure, and if you confess to all the contraventions that you've been involved in, and you provide all the evidence, we will uh, be lenient towards you. We will penalize you if you're not first, but we'll be lenient to, towards you, all right? So that was the incentive that we gave to the firms. And we, we sat back and we waited, and uh, we gave them a, a, a cut-off time, a deadline. We said by 15th of April, 
you must have, have applied for uh, leniency. If you have not, then we're going to prosecute you with the full extent of the law. That's what we will do. And uh, we were prepared to carry out our promise. And uh, suffice to say, uh, you know, our, um, our fax machines, our email was working overtime. Because we had over 21 firms, including the top six firms that applied for, for leniency. And they had, um, at the end of the, 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 the reporting period, they had, they had implicated themselves in 300 different contraventions. And, and I think that was quite a, a you know, enormous uh, amount of contraventions that we had to investigate. And then the further incentive we gave them, we told them, when we penalize you, we will not penalize you for each and every contravention. We will take all the contraventions and we'll put it into a basket. And depending on the number of contraventions and other factors, and depending on, on the extent to which you cooperated with us, we would give you a, a fine uh, in, a, in a specific range. For example, if you were involved in one or four contraventions, your penalty will be anything between one to four percent. If you if you were involved with over 23 over 23 contraventions, then your penalty will be anything between 10 to 12 percent of your of your annual annual uh, turnover. So this was a great incentive uh, for the firms. They they came forward in droves and they applied for for leniency. Now, the one good thing about this program is that what it did is that it created the prisoner's dilemma. So if I'm firm A and I'm applying for, for leniency and I didn't disclose everything, firm B will apply for leniency as well and they will implicate me in the contraventions that I did not disclose. And in the contraventions that firm A did not disclose, firm A would be prosecuted for that. And firm A would be prosecuted outside of this uh, program. And outside of this program, you would now go back to 10% of annual turnover on each and every contravention. So that was the dilemma that most firms was in. And because they did not want to be prosecuted individually for, for the contravention, because they realized their fines would be extremely, extremely high, they decided that they were going to uh, ap uh, apply for, for leniency. Now, we reach a stage where um, we unfortunately, in, in our act, we have a prescription period. So any conduct that is more than three years old, the commission is uh, unable to prosecute anything more than three years old. So what we had to do is we had to strip out those contraventions that were at prescribed, and we had to focus on the contraventions uh, that were not uh, prescribed. And um, it was a very long process of negotiating uh, you know, the fines with the firms, also a long process of making sure that firms uh, provided all the evidence as well. So it made the job of the commission very, very easy in the sense that when we went to prosecute uh, the matter in the tribunal, that firms have already given us the, the evidence. They had, uh, they had, um, uh, at, 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 uh, at I had lawyers, uh, we did the internal investigation for them and they came and produced uh, the evidence. Where there were gaps in the evidence, we would uh, go through the normal process of uh, conducting uh, interrogations and we would uh, you know, supplement those gaps in the evidence uh, with those interrogations. But I, I can tell you that uh, we did a limited number of uh, interviews because the evidence that the firms provided was sufficient to prosecute, uh, prosecute them. Now, in the end, uh, out of the 21 firms that uh, applied for leniency, three firms uh, uh, obtained complete leniency for all the projects that they applied for and they were, they were not liable at all to pay any fine. Three firms decided not to apply for leniency and they decided to uh, take the chance and, uh, and be prosecuted. And we are in the process of prosecuting those three firms. And 15 firms decided uh, to, to settle. And the total fines uh, you know, uh, was 1.46 billion, uh, which is quite high in, 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 in South African terms. It was the largest cartel penalty that uh, we leave it uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in South Africa. Now, I want to maybe say a little bit about how this cartel operated. I think the modus operandi of this cartel would be quite interesting. It's uh, uh, perhaps a lot to learn from how they, they, they operated. Uh, firstly, is um, uh, the cartels op operated uh, nationally. In other words, they operated in all the regions of, uh, of South Africa. We have nine regions, and they operated in all the regions. It wasn't one large cartel. It was a number of regional cartels. So you'd find, uh, for example, you know, firms listed on the stock exchange would have uh, subsidiaries in all the provinces. 
and uh, they would operate in all those uh, provinces. And you'd find, for example, in one particular region, there'll be a cartel there that will allocate a, allocate a project that would uh, you know, tender collusively, etc. Now, a lot of these cartels, you'd find senior executives of the firms themselves, because there was such a huge incentive to inflate uh, prices. Just to give you an example, on the World Cup stadiums, some of those stadiums uh, cost uh, you know, the government almost two billion to build. And you can imagine uh, in South Africa, you know, the, the, the profit margins on a, on a World Cup stadium of that size is between five and six percent, the profit margin. And the cartels were, were, were inflating the profit margins to about 16.5 percent, which is a huge, huge inflation of, of, of prices, which affects uh, you know, consumer welfare, you know, because government now has less money to spend on consumers. So, so that was uh, basically, uh, you know, um, how, how the cartels inflated the prices. Now, what the cartels would do is that um, they would keep a, a black book. Now, in the black book, uh, they would keep track of uh, the various projects that they want to allocate uh, to the various cartel members. They will be meet uh, at, at the golf course. Uh, they will meet in restaurants. They would meet uh, maybe at the offices of uh, some of the the cartel members, and they will decide exactly who's going to build which uh, uh, stadium. So there were almost seven stadiums that was being built uh, during the World Cup, uh, and um, they decided among themselves who's going to build which stadium and what the profit margins were going to be on the stadium. Then they were involved with uh, the national roads, they were involved with uh, building of dams, building of schools, building of universities, infrastructure projects for the private sector. So they were allocating a lot of uh, those, those, uh, those projects as well. But what happened is one of the large firms uh, within that cartel realized that uh, the incentive to remain in the cartel was being diminished uh, because they realized that um, because they were involved with so many contraventions that uh, should their, their conduct be uncovered by the competition authority, that their fines were going to be way higher than all the profits that they have made from, uh, from the cartel. So I think the point I want to make in this regard is that cartel deterrence has a lot to do with incentives. It is about the incentive that you, uh, you, you create for the firms to actually come forward and, uh, and, and, and actually blow the whistle. I know one of my colleagues said uh, that um, you know, the leniency program sometimes don't work as effectively. But uh, our belief in South Africa is the leniency program will only work if there's incentive for firms to come forward and actually uh, blow the whistle. And I think with this program here, we managed to uh, create that incentive for firms to come forward and, uh, and blow the whistle. Now, in addition to you know, uh, neutralizing the, the cartel from a competition law perspective, what we've also done as well, there's a few other things we've done. We decided that um, in, the, in our act, um, uh, section 65 of our act, it talks about civil damages. And we believe that civil damages is an important, important reparation uh, in competition law. We believe that uh, because you know, um, uh, ordinary consumers uh, get armed by cartel conduct, uh, you know, and we believe that you know, um, clients especially that have been uh, you know, deprived of uh, the, the ability to invest those uh, additional funds that they had to pay to the cartelers, that we, they should have the ability to uh, claim civil damages. So there's, there's two uh, options in our act. One is the, the respondent firm is able to negotiate a lower fine if they settle civil damages uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a client. Now that's another incentive for, 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 for a respondent firm to actually settle civil damages because their fine will be lower. It's not uh, a ran for ran, but uh, we would look at you know, minusing a certain percentage uh, from their fine. That's the one option. The other option is that um, when the matter goes to our competition tribunal, which is equivalent to a seat of a high court, is that uh, if there is a finding of, uh, of a collusion against a firm, uh, that, uh, that uh, litigant, uh, civil litigant, can get a certificate from the chairperson of the tribunal and take that to a civil court, and that becomes prima facie proof of the collusion, and they can use that to claim uh, civil damages. So it makes claiming civil damages uh, much easy for a, uh, for a client. Obviously, the client still got to, got to prove, uh, you know, the actual uh, damages in a in a civil civil court. Then a, that was the one thing. Then the other thing we did, 
is that we worked a lot with uh, other law enforcement agencies. Now, as you know, um, uh, cartel conduct in South Africa is very much administrative in nature. But we also know that uh, cartels, by their very nature, also commit criminal law offenses as well, like fraud and money laundering and racketeering. They also involve, uh, you know, in, in those kind of activities when they conduct uh, their cartel uh, behavior. So what we did is uh, we involved uh, you know, the, uh, the other policing agencies, and we also involved the National Prosecuting Authority as well. And um, we, we kind of, in a sense, agreed with them that once we have conducted and finalized our investigation, that they would subpoena the, the evidence from us, and they would use that evidence in a, uh, in, in a criminal case. And they would decide whether they want to use any of uh, the leniency applicants as uh, state witnesses in the case. Now, in South African law, in terms of our Criminal Procedure Act, there's also uh, criminal immunity as well. So you can uh, use those, uh, those uh, witnesses as state witnesses, and they are immunized from any crim criminal uh, prosecution. So uh, at, at the very moment, as we speak, um, the criminal authorities are busy investigating the, the criminal offenses. Then the third thing we did is we worked also very closely with other regulators as well. Now, in South Africa, uh, you know, the Competition Authority is a, is a competition-wide uh, regulator, whereas in every uh, sector, you have uh, sector-wide uh, uh, regulators as well. And in the construction industry, we have a regulator in the construction industry as well. Now, the, the regulators in the construction industry, they have different powers. And one of their powers that they have is they can discipline firms that have been guilty of unethical conduct. And what they would do is they would discipline the firms in a different way they would not necessarily leave you a penalty or a fine, but they would uh, prevent the firms from, for example, engaging in public procurement for a period of time. I mean, that's a huge disincentive for, for firms uh, if they are unable to participate in uh, public procurement. Yeah. All right, I, I think I've come to the end of uh, my presentation. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, sir. I was very uh, happy and interested uh, to see that the law enforcement practices is uh, pretty close to our practices. You have even outlined uh, uh, the problems that uh, we have uh, here in uh, Russia. We, uh, you have hosted the, the uh, World Cup. We will host the World Cup, and so we are in the case of uh, active uh, infrastructure construction. We have uh, cases when uh, the um, estimated costs uh, doubled or even tripled. Uh, I am uh, pretty much sure that our anti-cartel uh, uh, authorities would be interested in, to investigate this fact. And using this occasion, I would like to extend my congratulations on the 15th anniversary of uh, your establishment. I know that uh, uh, soon you will have a national conference dedicated to this uh, happy date. Uh, we will be happy to attend, uh, if provided you uh, invite us, of course. All right, uh, Q's and A's. I think the uh, presentation was uh, pretty much uh, self-evident and uh, exhausting. I believe I'm the only uh, economist around here. Do we have another one? I think we do, don't we? Vitaly, you're often an opponent, opponent and uh, critic of our actions, uh, but uh, always a professional and uh, justified. Uh, Mr. Pruzhansky, expert of uh, RBP economics. I know that the uh, audience uh, is uh, tired of uh, sitting in this uh, room, but nevertheless, uh, may I ent entertain you with a story. Oh, Ronald Holmes, a Nobel laureate, an American na national, once said, I'm uh, fed up with antitrust uh, action because antitrust um, 
authorities uh, believe that they are the only monopoly around. Uh, on top of uh, sarcasm of uh, this anecdote, uh, uh, this uh, story is underpinned by a very serious idea. Even a professional uh, or a group of professionals would oftentimes find it very hard to get to the bottom of the matter, uh, to unwind uh, the entire cartel uh, cartelship. I believe practitioners uh, would agree and subscribe to this opinion. A cartel um, arrangements are, was, is a very serious violation of uh, antitrust legislation. It is not by chance and for a good reason that uh, fines are so high for cartel agreements. The responsibility, the liability is uh, uh, high uh, in order to deter future cartel agreement. One of the challenges is uh, to avoid uh, false uh, false alarms, uh, that is, cases or signals uh, when uh, cartels did not really exist. Uh, such situations uh, do arise uh, once in a while when uh, sort of uh, negative arrangements uh, arise. Uh, we stay within our sphere of influence, uh, one company says to the other, and please stay away from our sphere of inf influence and uh, um, stay within yours, your territory. Such information often comes uh, to our radar. Sometimes uh, giving grounds uh, for cartel, uh, anti-cartel investigation. Well, first what we have to do is uh, to apply economic analysis. Economic analysis allows us to save investigation time and effort. It is analysis, a screening uh, for common sense, uh, for some basic facts. Cartel agreement usually has as its effect uh, higher prices and uh, uh, elbowing out of um, competitors. So uh, higher prices and uh, smaller a uh, smaller amount of sales uh, would be the hallmarks of a cartel agreement. If we don't, do not have these uh, two twin uh, parameters, uh, we cannot expect uh, to have a clear-cut anti-cartel case. The federal uh, anti-cartel, uh, anti-trust uh, service uh, is uh, becoming more professional every year and uh, this is a very good fact but still we are very f far away from the level that where we'd like to be especially in uh, what concerns anti-cartel action now here it would be appropriate uh, to uh, dwell a bit in detail on uh, the econo economic aspects of cartel investigations. I will um, uh, draw upon personal experience, both in Russia and in the Soviet Union. Well, first thing I'd like to say that we oftentimes f fail or forget to apply straightforward economic analysis. Therefore, our findings uh, simply may not be uh, justified. It is often the case uh, that the companies come together over things. They may be, seems, may be suspicion, suspicious for the anti-cartel authorities. Once they uh, see something suspicious, they uh, rush in the situation and uh, initiate investigation, oftentimes unwarranted. First, the question that we would uh, have to ask before initiati initiating an investigation is, is a cartel called for in this particular case? Is there 
a benefit uh, to be gained uh, through a cartel. For example, simply raising prices would uh, uh, trigger uh, the, the diminishing demand uh, that would eat away the profits. Uh, so, very s simple, a cartel could not exist in this situation. Then uh, our next uh, question begs itself, uh, what is the method of evaluating uh, uh, market prowess uh, of uh, a company? Uh, how can we measure the effect of uh, domination uh, of a certain company? If there is no domination of a company in the market, there's no place for a cartel. This also uh, involves uh, a lot of uh, economic footwork, um, delineating uh, the limits of the market, measuring its capacity and the things like that. Another example of suspicious behavior uh, could be establishment of uh, similar prices or a simultaneous uh, price movement. on the face of things that may be a, a cartel. However, such situations may have a, a very plain economic underpinning. Maybe economic analysis in, uh, in the economic actors was simply right. This may be a fact of a serious competition among the actors of the market and they're following closely uh, price movements uh, of one another. If you want to stay in the market, you have to watch your neighbor. Therefore, follow his prices. Maybe it's a matter of additional uh, costs involved uh, for some uh, uh, external reason. Therefore, any price change, any price movement cannot be taken as a measure of, uh, uh, as a proof of existence of a cartel. Without a proper economic analysis, uh, making such a judgment uh, would uh, be begging for an error. There are so many other factors that have to put into uh, uh, analysis in order to, before making a decision to initiate an investigation. In my experience, we have had cases when tenders for medical supplies in Russia would uh, uh, involve uh, 10 participants uh, accused of cartel agreement. Of course, we cannot exclude cartel agreement among a good number of participants in an economic tender. We have had uh, a good number of cases proving this. Yet, uh, we must be aware that this is a very rare occasion. The plain fact is that uh, for a cartel to exist, there is a number of conditions uh, uh, to be met. First of all, the uh, transparent environment, uh, price-making environment. Uh, the members of cartel could must be uh, in a position uh, to see the movement of each other to monitor each other's actions. They must be able to uh, punish or enforce uh, uh, the members of the cartel uh, to stay in fold. If there are no conditions like that, if, then this, the cartel simply cannot exist. The baseline of my first idea is that application of economic analysis may uh, be a very proper screening mechanism uh, prior to any effective investigation. Now, moving on to my second idea, is the full if effective use of economic instruments uh, in uh, anti-cartel investigations. It would be wrong to say that uh, uh, FAS uh, uh, does not apply economics uh, or economic experience uh, in uh, its uh, cases. 
the other thing uh, is to say that uh, the quality of this analysis uh, uh, remains to be desired. Now, oftentimes um, FAS uses the price statistics as a lead uh, to identify a case of a cartel agreement. But we first have to ask ourselves a question. How true is the statistic or how often such a trend occurs? Now, suppose we have 10 providers. We can see uh, higher prices for seven items sold by those providers and uh, well, uh, three other items stay put. So where's the cartel? What's going on? Uh, what if uh, the high the price rise did not exceed inflation or remain below inflation? Therefore, econometric and statistical analysis must be a regular tool. We must master those mechanisms to be effective in our cartel investigations and to avoid uh, false uh, paths. There could be cases of market division or marking of territories by uh, businesses, establishing uh, unofficial quotas for themselves, or fixing uh, market shares. This is also a way to uh, um, dampen the competition. Then we have to establish uh, how true is the statement of about uh, the uh, sharing of the market or marking the territory. We have to uh, have a, a, an idea of uh, market architecture before and after. In situations like this, I believe uh, facts have to be scrutinized by uh, e economic and analysts and experts. This requires time, of course, but this is a necessary step to be on the right path. We need specialists, we need professionals who understand uh, economic statistics, who can, can handle numbers and uh, do analytical work. Now, a lack of professional competence or professionalism in statistics is not, a, uh, is not to say that we are not going to do it. It is not a pretext uh, not to apply it. It is rather a challenge for us to acquire those skills and competencies. The economic element in uh, anti-cartel investigations, and I'm drawing the bottom line, uh, since it gives us an instrument uh, to uh, identify uh, true cases uh, from false cases. Concepts like market, market shares are not legal concepts, they are economic concepts. Now we, in principle, uh, show good uh, positive progress. So we are growing, we are increasing our competencies, our uh, colleagues in other countries, in the United States especially, are uh, doing uh, good progress as well. This is a very good thing and I believe that uh, the leadership of our FAS uh, must uh, keep a keen eye on the developments uh, beyond our borders on, on top of the all good things that they have done uh, uh, in their offices. Again, effective use of uh, economic instruments uh, would be very, very beneficial for the success of uh, AEC investigation. Okay. It will direct business there, but also antitrust agencies will benefit from that because they will be able to focus on more significant cases where really the limitation of, comp uh, of monopoly could be more effective. So they will be able to stop uh, digging in details and some. Then it will also be beneficial for the courts, giving them firmer cases. So if we all 
uh, direct our efforts in this uh, direction that will enable us to bring antitrust practice on a qualitatively new level. I know that time is limited today, so I'll bring my speech to closure. And of course, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to tackle them. Thank you, Vitaly. What I would like to note is that indeed now we are including more and more economic and mathematical models into the uh, our into our evidence base mm, the models that were used against cartels actually i used to be a specialist on mathematical models and uh, just before capitalism, I specialized on, on them. So uh, it was very interesting for me to uh, explore the evidence of this kind uh, in uh, other countries' practices. But um, what I would like to say, a lot has been done in the legal area in uh, designing uh, policies, antitrust, and uh, to protect competition, and that also engaged a uh, but uh, again, I don't know many specialists in this area uh, from other professions. We're just uh, three major blocks uh, at the uh, legal forum are discussing this issue. But for some reason, at the economic forum, they do not discuss this topic at all. Why, I wonder? So antitrust case is an amalgamation of a lot of things, and it can provide a lot uh, just a material uh, for a, uh, doctoral dissertation on economics and on law. Unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, PhD dissertation on uh, law uh, uh, related with antitrust uh, legislation, but few, if any, in economics. Uh, are there any questions or counter comments? We'll be happy to help if we can. Okay. Vladimir Vladimirov from uh, FAS, St. Petersburg, Russia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Porgansky, for your presentation, and I fully agree with m Mr. Tselikovsky. It's uh, all the... But having experience with two regional agencies, the things that you are talking about is the far future of our anti-trust practice. This kind of analysis that is uh, done in uh, EU by our colleagues, mm, well, uh, as one of the uh, leading fighters against monopolies would say, learn, learn, and learn. This is what uh, we are lacking. So then I have some partners from police and from others. I think that it's easier to uh, uh, reach agreement with police and make a couple of good raids, uh, the sun's uh, raids, uh, than to uh, just uh, reach agreement with economists. It's uh, for the regions, for example, it's uh, an impossibility because of the lack of specialists and because of other reasons. I also have a brief comment. Indeed, thank you very much for this presentation. The uh, topic raised is of uh, immense importance. But uh, then uh, another theme is interesting. It's indirect evidence. We uh, had several cases against cartels where we built only on indirect evidence, mathematical uh, uh, models and so on, and we managed to win those cases, and we are proud of them. But uh, so just... Uh, uh, in more than 90%, uh, of cases, uh, evidence is uh, direct, only direct evidence uh, enables to win the case. So we uh, conduct get checkups, uh, just uh, and find some evidence, or some evidence is brought by those who apply for a lenience pro program and so on. So the second thing, 
So if there are those lenient applications when one or several participants, and we had the cases when there were two, three, four of them uh, ready to cooperate with the antitrust agency, uh, help in uh, collecting evidence and uh, help in the case of appeals. So cartel cases, and this is my uh, deepest conviction, must be proven by direct evidence. Uh, texts of anti-competition agreements, confessions, uh, then uh, all kinds of evidence and testimony and all that. But indirect uh, evidence, including economic analysis, is an important attribute, but only uh, serving I as addition to the direct evidence. Yes, I fully agree that direct evidence uh, are of top importance, but even when we have uh, direct evidence of cartel, we shouldn't neglect the importance of economic analysis. Let me give you only one example, which uh, deems to me mm, very eloquent. When it is about uh, the fine, the amount of the fine, we uh, must uh, somehow weigh the gravity of the violation. And, uh, of course, if it is a cartel collusion between a hundred members, or if it is only between two or three, these are two different things, and the uh, damage uh, of these two types will be totally different. And so when defining the amount of the fine to be paid out, this uh, is important. Uh, yes, one more brief comment, if I may. I would like to uh, offer a clarification. When uh, we mentioned statistics, uh, just uh, the figure of 70 percent of uh, uh, collusions about trade uh, was mentioned. Here we can fully rely on indirect evidence, but when it is about collusions on uh, good markets, then of course uh, such cases can rest only on direct evidence plus indirect uh, evidence as uh, an economic analysis. I'm Bashlakov Nikolai, uh, uh, FAS uh, head assistant, and uh, I used to work in provinces, and we uh, often used economic evidence, and we had an interesting case when we uh, just uh, appealed to the uh, theory of relativity to prove that it was really a collusion. Because otherwise, uh, just without cartel, that event wouldn't have been possible. Again, uh, just referring to the theory of relativity. But uh, then, of course, I um, agree that, yes, indeed, evidence uh, must be direct and relevant and all that. And uh, economic analysis is indirect evidence, but essential. So uh, you remember we discussed quick look approach during our first session. And we shouldn't really forget about the per se principle. And uh, if you um, uh, missed this uh, the discussion of quick look uh, approach uh, mentioned by Judge Douglas. And uh, just uh, if we uh, kind of think about your discourse about the evidence, there are some similarities. So uh, if you uh, suggest including economic analysis as an uh, essential part of the evidence or not, so what should be dominating? You know what, I really can't uh, give you any comments on what was said by Judge Douglas. I was not present here at that moment of time, but um, building on my European experience, I can say that yes, if it is indirect evidence, then the role of economic evidence and analysis, well, if there is direct evidence, then the uh, economic analysis plays a secondary role. But very often, uh, direct evidence is lacking, or antitrust agencies fail to uh, cover them, then uh, economic evidence is enough to prove the uh, collusion. For example, trade association collects information from its members, producers of some good, or uh, collects information about the prices, or maybe about the geography of sales. And then this uh, data becomes uh, accessible to members of this association online with a lag of one month. 
uh, how can this uh, situation be categorized? Is it anti-competitive? Uh, per se principle is not enough because uh, does this exchange of information uh, violate anything? Potentially it can because it can delimit competition uh, if members uh, exchange certain information they can better coordinate some of their steps but uh, some additional conditions are also necessary so the per se rule uh, is applicable only in some exceptional cases when it is more than evident that the competitive element will dominate. Then there is uh, no sense uh, making economic analysis. But such cases are getting fewer and fewer because they also improve. Because uh, let us put ourselves into the boots of two enterprises who want to form a cartel and they r realize uh, the danger of it. And then, of course, they won't sign anything, any written agreements. And then uh, the agencies will have to do hell of investigation to prove the collusion. And uh, then uh, the whole uh, proof will build on indirect evidence that is economic analysis. There is no other way. Thank you. Well, our session is coming to closure. As we already said, cartel cases should uh, sometimes end up as criminal cases. And now I'd like to give the floor over to Eduard Dabrinian, who uh, just uh, represents for the paper. So thank you for this floor. Um, Dear colleagues, indeed, we are discussing a very serious theme, and it has not been for the first year that we've been doing that, how to counteract cartel uh, collusions, and um, what we decided. We uh, defined some ways to regulate this problem, but it's not the issue of having them, but it's the issue of the efficiency thereof. So, and let's discuss efficiency then. We know that antitrust legislation is uh, regulated by criminal law. For example, uh, Article 178 that stipulates responsibility or liability for uh, violating uh, antitrust legislation. This is uh, con uh, cartel collusions and uh, also abusing domination, dominating position. So three years passed uh, since this was introduced. Has anything changed? No. We see that this uh, rule is not functional. When preparing for my presentation, presentation today, I came across the article by Kinyov, and he said that statistics of crime antitrust crime uh, within the uh, monopoly area is within the statistical era uh, degree. Nine criminal cases uh, initiated and zero verdicts. Impression is that nobody abuses dominating position at the Russian market and there are no cartels in Russia. But at the same time, um, Article 178 uh, just uh, describes certain activities, and these activities are regulated by administrative code, by uh, Article 431-432. FAS uh, initiates about 10,000 administrative cases. Uh, out of them, 2,000 in 2013 was about abusing dominating position on the market. Uh, 1,200 uh, were uh, initiated against cartels within that last year, 2013. So we do have some prerequisites. But what's the problem? What's the challenge? According to 178, uh, one of the uh, preconditions is uh, repeatedness in uh, abusing the dominant position. And this repeatedness uh, becomes uh, the stumbling stone. As practice would show, there are lots of mechanisms to uh, go around this. The easiest way is that they change the CEO or general manager. So, in my view, there is uh, 
But just one evident change amendment is inviting itself. Let us exclude this word in the definition, repeatedness. Or, uh, and uh, then let's introduce the limitation of uh, under one million ruble uh, damage its administrative uh, responsibility, above one million damage its uh, criminal. And uh, then, um, as for the zero cases initiated, this is the core reason is incompetence of our law enforcement agencies. And then there are three ways, as we see it. Number one, actually it was mentioned, it's cooperation between uh, the police and federal antitrust service. But what we suggest is not cooperation, but it's just we, uh, the, the just some police uh, employees are delegated to be part of antitrust service. For them to be educated, maybe even pass an exam, get a diploma, understand how to reveal cartels, how to work with that, and then they go back to police and they start investigating cases. If that doesn't help, then probably the most, uh, the simplest would be to mandate police officers, mandate, I emphasize it, to engage uh, specialists from antitrust uh, services uh, at the stage of uh, pre-investigation. Uh, uh, just fast specialists must be engaged for fast specialists to assist them in investigating the crime. And the third way is probably the best in our view, the most uh, adequate. Uh, and uh, it uh, consists in the following. He should just uh, take this function of uh, the investigation uh, bodies and make it responsibility of us uh, to process. Nobody then uh, can do it better than us. They are the uh, people who are the most knowledgeable in NATO trust um, legislation, and they know how to reveal those crimes and how to investigate into them. Now it's cases, and in the future it will be crimes, so, so that should be supported by statistics. And st secondly, the criminal uh, law um, provides uh, the uh, possibility for our law enforcement agencies to Mm, uh, classify crimes into different categories. For example, let us take bailiffs. Uh, for example, this avoidance of uh, paying out allowances for children and so on and so forth. So who deals with that? Bailiffs. So uh, following the, for this analogy with law enforcement, we can delegate this responsibility to FAS. And then we are confident, well, of course, firstly, administrative uh, procedures will go down. The number, uh, the burden for administrative courts will be less. And actually, inavoidability of punishment must be there. And if entities, economic entities, will know that something more than administrative responsibility is uh, in play, then we'll have less problems with cartel collusions and uh, ab the abuse of the dominant position of, on the market. Thank you very much for your attention. I think that is it. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, I feel suspicious. For some reason, we were not enough criticized today, because I remember a discussion about the fourth package on anti terrorist I don't realize why I'm not having broken legs and arms. Uh, so probably just in our anti-cartel activities, we cooperate with businesses more. So thank you for those comments. Very brief one, if I may. I was really surprised by uh, what I have heard. As for cartels, I understand uh, criminal responsibility, but why abuse of dominant position? I thought uh, my uh, impression was that uh, uh, we never had any criminal responsibility for the abuse of dominant position. Why are we like pendulum going from extremity to extremity? Either it's just uh, just not punishable at all, or if we uh, just uh, do not follow our warning, we immediately sue you criminally. So, but otherwise, I am fully supportive of what I heard. On behalf of us, 
I can say we are also against that. We think that uh, the period between now and 2003 has proven that uh, just abuse of uh, dominant position and all the measures, just Article 178 is not functional regarding that, uh, including the recommendation of OSER. So we should eliminate or exclude criminal responsibility from this kind of situations. So we have already written the draft for the amendment of this uh, article of the law and uh, mm, soon uh, it will be implemented. Thank you again. We've exhausted the list of our speakers, but as a representative of executive power, I can't I refuse myself in the uh, pleasure of giving the floor to the uh, executive power. Dear colleagues, uh, I'm really... I'm happy to welcome you uh, here on behalf of our uh, Duma Committee and Federal Federation Council Committee on uh, the Economy and uh, Finance. Uh, speaking about criticism, I have a piece of criticism f to offer. We maintain uh, very close contacts, uh, contact, contacts with FAS. However, we never went beyond uh, uh, operational contacts, um, conference exchanges, uh, uh, so forth, uh, leaving aside uh, uh, the frontline aspect of uh, the enforcement as aspect of their activities. We would like to offer our services, would like to extend our hand uh, to do the drafting exercises, uh, uh, to find the legal solutions. So please uh, uh, don't hesitate to address us. In December, this forum uh, had a retreat session in uh, Hungary. We discussed with our colleagues uh, issues of uh, uh, pre-trial settlement. My proposal there was uh, to uh, align Russian and European legislation just for practical utilitarian purposes. I suggested the idea of uh, pan-European amnesty. Uh, today, uh, with my colleague Birikov, uh, we have drafted a, uh, an amnesty of a pan -European, uh, for pan-European activities on uh, expatriated capital. Little by little, this idea gains ground in the legislative uh, premises. I suggest uh, that we uh, uh, discuss this issue with you. Many of the things that you have said uh, are very close to my heart. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, Senate had the last word today. Well, anyway, colleagues, uh, again, uh, thank you so much uh, for your participation. The discussion proved to be very lively. Have a good day.